the first thing I want to show you is that I, ha I have built a coal pits. And uh, this, this, this board here was for uh, a direct conversion uh, circuit found in the AARL book. And uh, the thing you could hear it drifting. It was, it was pathetic. In other words, when you first turn on the, the circuit and you tune in in a sideband, you hear a ham and you, you constantly have to touch it up. And then after it's on, uh, let's say uh, 10 minutes, it, it's still, you still have to keep touching it up. So uh, I found a, a, a website where a guy basically, uh, he works with a coal pits and, the, and, the, and drift and trying to get it better. And he complains that someone said they had it within a few hertz. And uh, I went that route. See, here it is. I actually built it, and I wasn't happy with it. And then one day I saw that Franklin oscillator circuit, and I was building something else. And I'm like, this thing seems like really stable. So I, uh, I hooked it up to the direct conversion unit, and it worked. And it stayed, like, really good. And I'm like, well, how, could this, how could there be that much difference in drift? Well, there was. And this has, this is loaded up with polystyrene capacitors. Instead of NPOs or yeah NPOs, they're actually supposed to be better. Well, anyway, uh, this does not work right with a huff and puff. See, I I used this with the huff and puff, and the huff and puff had a hard time keeping this locked. So then I went and put the the Franklin on, and it locked much after after one minute it would stay locked with low values of. Of varactor capacitance and then later on I realized I could use a little bit more oomph to hold it wait 24 hours turn it on again make sure it locks immediately and it did see if you read about huff and puff it says it makes a, a, a great oscillator even better and it does if the oscillator drifts very little the huff and puff has no trouble keeping it dead on so if you want to take your your Franklin and make it even better. Uh, put a huff and puff. Go look at my circuits on huff and puff. See, I got away from huff and puff because, uh, and, and huff and puff sitting back here. Here it is here, this this circuit board. Uh, on the test bed. Uh, I, uh, I got away from it because there were, there were just too many parts. I wanted something really simple. And then I got into, into the, uh, looking at the Collins and the whole, it's been one big, Adventure. Now, as you remember, this unit, I, I told you I was going to line it with um, milk jug plastic. Right? Milk jug plastic. Took off the flattest sides, laid it, took all the, took all the parts out of that box, put the bent, cut and bent in um, the milk bottle uh, plastic, and then put the parts back in it. And the bolts that hold the circuit board and all that, they hold the plastic in place. And then on the back of it, with the back part that slips together on the, uh, the case itself, uh, I have another piece of, of uh, milk jug plastic. So it's, sit, it's not sitting really in an aluminum case now. It's in an insulated case. So yesterday, I stabilized this room temperature-wise. And this thing stayed within 10 degrees, or 10 hertz. All right? It does stay within 10. I'm getting the same results as I got during the summer when the room is stable. So we know that the Franklin oscillator does not like being put in a, in a, in an aluminum can. Uh, the heat gets transferred in and out of the aluminum like basically it's not even there. So you're going to have some type of insulation. But the Franklin is so much better than all the other oscillators. That you could build uh, drift wise and a couple people uh, mentioned in different places why didn't they ever heard of a Frank I don't know I bumped into it one day I saw it had very few parts I put it together it did more than what I wanted and that became my go-to oscillator but right now we're going to do a cold start this thing hasn't been on since yesterday the room is warming up now but overnight everything cooled down so this thing should be up in frequency and it is. See, it's up in frequency because it's cool. Now, it's it it will go up 100 and, 104 hertz. Hertz. We're talking hertz. Other people 
the one circuit guy says it's within 17 kilohertz of drift. I'm like, I'm reading, I'm like, the whole, no, that, that's what this thing, this thing's really pathetic. And you don't want hertz, you don't want drift when you're doing sideband or code. It, it'll make you nuts. And all your radios eventually will settle down to some degree. And that's the thing. I'm trying to tell you in layman's turn, what other people, they get too technical right away with the, with the drift, and they don't say how much. And I, I keep digging, and I do find once in a while, uh, somebody gives you a number. They'll throw out a number. Like the one guy used number 17 kilohertz, and I went, whoa, I'm, I'm all upset over, you know, in this case, this would be 100 hertz, right? 1, 10, 100. That's if the frequency counter isn't drifting at all. You know, I mean, you can get really nitpicky on all this, but I stay with stuff because I don't want to think about this oscillator anymore. I now know how to work with it, and it's it's super overkill for my pseudo Collins circuits that I've been working on. You know, I have the Collins radio now. I don't need to build it in transistor circuits, but it's been fun understanding that how they take incoming frequencies and they block convert it down in frequency so they can use a lower frequency VFO. Pure genius back in those days. And it's still a great radio to this day. And uh, I, I just didn't want the huff and puff in there. And I don't want a DDS. And the huff and puff, uh, it does introduce a little tiny bit of noise. Uh, the, uh, the DDSs produce a different kind of noise. It's not in the audio. It's, it's up and down the band. And this frequency counter from eBay also produces uh, frequency birds on your, your band. You know, you'll get like a carrier, and then uh, you, you shut just the, uh, just the frequency counter off, and it goes away. So there's a lot involved when you build things. And when you really learn is when you stay with something. And you, what I tell you to do is just keep reading. Somebody has been where you are years ago and some of them some of them put the information down i do it a different way i give you the general idea i use words like franklin oscillator go look it up go find a circuit go build it you know other people oh it would be nice if you had a schematic and boy do i see that a lot lately as i'm searching uh i'll hit a youtube video and uh they really hounded this one guy for uh, uh, a schematic and what he did was he took uh, one tube and he made a, a a super heterodyne radio with one tube but the trick is the tube has two tubes inside of it so it's not a one it's really not a one tube radio and then the other guy did one and it's a single tube and that's the one they were hounding so he figures it all out now somebody else down in the comments on this one got mad and finally located a schematic that that guy used and then he posted it and uh, yeah you can make a one tube super het radio and it's a very interesting project but how many radios do I have to build I'm into the I'm into the rabbit hole of the oscillator uh, understanding each section of the radio and putting the best section I can now in this case like I said I I, I line this box with the um, the milk jug plastic I also sealed it up that red that red stuff that's uh, the aluminum that aluminum tape that you put around an air conditioner like duct tape and it's aluminum and I put I finished the box up in most sides uh, sealing it up but this will go down when I get this room when I get this room stabilized temperature wise and I put this on and the oscillator is stabilized 10 Hertz and to me it's laughable to even talk about 10 hertz of drift. It's laughable unless you're doing something scientific. If you're doing like GPS or something like that, yes, you got to have even better than 10 hertz. And they use a double a double oven chip to on their um, uh, what the hell it would be it would be a XCO or X. There's a name for the little module that gives you 10 megahertz. I, I believe it's 10 they use. But this is it's been an adventure. It's sort of fun, and uh, that's what I do. You know, a little bit each day. You know, like uh, it took part of one day and part of the other day to take that can apart and then cut the pieces out of the uh, 
the uh, milk jug and to lay them in there and get it the way I wanted. And then to get this room stabilized. Like right now, it's a little too hot for my taste. It's gone up a little too warm. And, uh, you know, then, then when you shut the, the heat back, it's, it, the room starts cooling right away because it's, it's a 10 by 10 room. It's got a simple baseboard heater and outside's getting cooler. Yesterday was incredibly warm. Uh, it was very easy to stabilize this room, just like it was doing during the summer when I said, I got this thing within 10 hertz. And then uh, the weather changed and this room started getting really cold and I'm, I'm, my, my oscillator's going all over the place. And then uh, the freezer bag, the freezer bag really got me there. In other words, when I put everything in the freezer bag, it, if the room went up and down a lot, the uh, oscillator would, would stay within a better range. And that's what I'm saying. It is temperature. And then you say that, well, how is the Franklin temperature wise versus the cold pits? I wouldn't even use the cold pits. I don't care what you do with that thing. Go read up on the people that have used it that didn't like it. I didn't like it. That's why I went looking. And I would have, it was just by accident I hit on the uh, Franklin. And I'm telling you, when you when you look for a Franklin oscillator now, there's all kinds of hits on Google. But when I was doing it, uh, how many years ago? Three years ago more? When I first used the oscillator? I, I found one little reference of it. And I'm looking, reading this like, well, I never heard of this oscillator before. And you know what happens when that happens, right? I have to build it. And that's, I don't talk about building it. I immediately clear off a space on, on my messy bench and I start putting the parts there and I get that wireless proto board out and I put the pieces together and I get it to least oscillate and then it goes over to perf board and then I put the scope on it and I, I say what can I use this for see other people they they'll contact me oh I need the schematic I want to try and they never do it's just, they want me to stop what I'm doing and, and, and send them a copy or, you know, and you got to go dig the copy up. Think about this. You go dig it up, you email it over, and the person never does anything with it. I had people around me like that, that every time they saw me doing something, they wanted to make believe they were going to do it. And I told you about that draw at RCA. You know, I get, I, get in, I get a job in RCA and I go in and they give me this nice old wooden desk. And that's where I'm going to work on my, my units on top of that desk. And in the back of the unit is Bakelite slab with all voltages. And um, I open the drawers up and they're packed. The drawers are packed. Where do I put my tools? So I cleared off one drawer and I put uh, the stuff in the top drawer down in the other drawers. And they're packed. And I really need more room. And uh, I said to myself, let me open those drawers and figure out what it is. And there were a bunch of paper bags in there. I mean, not just a few. So the guy next to me, Joe, I said, Joe, what is this? He goes, oh, all these guys in here, uh, years ago, we're going to build a, um, um, now I'm gonna, a grid dip meter. And I had built the ICO. I won't go into that story. But anyway, I know what a grid dip meter is. I used it. I was building projects and using the grid dip meter uh, before I had access to free, uh, formulas for coils. You could put the grid dip meter next to a coil and you would turn a dial, and when you see the needle fluctuate, that was the frequency that that uh, coil was at with, with a known capacitor across it, and then you can work from there. That's how, we, in way in the back, if you got a surplus coil, you could figure out what, what value it was. So anyway, so we're back to all these paper bags, and they open up the paper bags, <coughs> and each one of them's got like four freaking parts in it. Every bag's the same. So I said, what's going on? He goes, yeah, they were all going to build grid dip meters. So they started gathering the parts. Now, I recognized those parts as being from our department. So I walked around with, well, first I tried to get these guys to take the bags out of there. I'm going to get to it. I'm going to, it was 10 years and they didn't get to it. And they all, so finally I just said, look, you got to two o'clock to come get, no one came for the bags. So I took all the bags out. And I dumped them out, and I took the parts, I resorted, and I put them back away in the bins where they belong. And that's when I learned about men and bullshit. And it really hit me then. I, you know, you're around people that you say, oh, he ain't never going to do it. But then you realize how many men will uh, suddenly want something because the other guy has it. Now, yesterday, I sort of did the thing. I'm across the street helping a neighbor. He rents. He pays money for rent but yet there's this tree in front of the house and it's really tall up against the house so i went over and cut it down for him we trimmed it. it was a holly bush 
So off comes these nice pieces of holly, which you could basically make a wreath out of. Now this woman comes by and she she stops the car and she comes out and she starts, can I have, yeah, I said, you could take as much as you want. I said, take some branches, take them home and then cut off what you want. Don't take all the little, yeah, little clippings. So she does. So this other girl walks by that I know and I start showing her the holly pieces and it's got the, the holly leaves, the stem and those little berries on it. It looked, it looked really nice. I said, here, Take this back to where you work and just, just like hang this up. It'll look nice, you know. I said, but I'm going to warn you, when you go back to work, uh, the other people around you are going to ask where you got it. And But anyway, because I understand this now, that people will see someone have something, they'll want it. It's just, it's it's baby shit, all right. And uh, that's what I had. I had three drawers full of, of baby shit. And, uh, oh, I'm going to build that. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. I, I, had, I had people around me that pulled this. That's why I'm like this. And someone says, oh, you're full of yourself. No, I've realized what people actually do. And I told you, Oprah says, you keep making the same mistake until you learn the lesson. And that's so true. In other words, you keep uh, catering to people that, oh, I need that schematic. I'm going to build it. You're going to build it in your hereafter or in your dreams. My friend calls them dream operators. They go to train shows. They talk about trains. They talk about setting a train layup, but they don't buy. They don't build. They don't operate, but they're dream operators. And there's dream builders. There's people that collect schematics for things that they're never going to build. And they'll get a person that's busy to stop what they're doing to give them a schematic. And that's what I learned. I'm not that person anymore. You know, at first your ego, you know, oh, this person's asking me, he must think a lot of me. No, they're dream builders. I think that's it. All right, that's it.